The name Earth exists in most languages, associating our planet with the terra firma, which is how we usually think of it. Whereas the real and true name of our planet, you can rest assured, might easily be ocean. After all, liquid water in the form of hydrosphere covers about 71% of the Earth's surface, or about 361 million square kilometers, leaving only 29% of the planet's area for dry land. There are places in space from which that's exactly how our planet looks, like it's nothing but ocean, the pearl in our solar system. When we try to look beyond its bounds, we find that we are surrounded by countless rocky and lifeless planets, in actual fact, dead worlds. And finding an ocean planet is an incredible rarity. Yet ocean planets exist in other distant systems, and every so often, very rarely, we find them. But never before, three ocean planets in one system. Even the system in which you and I are located can't afford this luxury. Welcome to an extraordinary environment, L9859, in the center of which is located a bright dwarf star of the M3V type, situated 34.6 light years away in the southern Valens constellation. Also known as TOI-175, the star is equal to about one-third of the Sun's mass. It is indeed a dwarf, but apparently without active flares. Consequently, that has a favorable effect upon the planets, of which there are as many as five in the system. The planets L9859 b, c, d, e and f. Two of them are rocky planets, such as Earth and Venus, which are close enough to the star to actually have a chance for primitive life. But the other three planets may contain water below the surface or in the atmosphere. Two of them contain a small amount of water, while up to 30% of the third planet's mass can be little more than water, which makes it an ocean world. What is known about these worlds? What are the chances that they have life? This is what we will talk about, but first things first, in order. Observations were carried out using the telescopes of the VLT facility, the TESS telescope and the HARPS spectrograph. The radii of those closest to the star, the exoplanets L9859 b and c, according to TESS, range from 0.8 to 1.6 that of the Earth. These are very intriguing numbers, since a planet the size of ours is unlikely to be composed of ice or gas. Most likely, it will be similar in chemical composition to the Earth and Earth-like worlds, which for obvious reasons are of greater interest to mankind than any others. Having estimated the mass of the worlds of the L9859 system with the knowledge of their size, astronomers calculated their density. Planet L9859b is like Venus, but L9859c is almost like the Earth. It is believed that both of the exoplanets are Earth-like worlds, with small 12 to 14 percent of their mass iron cores. For comparison, the mass of the Earth's core is approximately 30 percent. Indeed, these two planets are interesting, but they are rocky and extremely hot for a comfortable existence. Quite another matter is L9859d, the third planet in terms of distance, which is located in the middle of the system and is in the habitable zone. This world could aptly be called not the planet Earth, but the planet water. Judging by its density, water makes up to 36% of the mass of this celestial body. This is an extraordinarily good result. During a migration due to powerful turbulent disturbances, this sort of an icy planet, with a mass of six to eight times that of the Earth, can find itself sufficiently near enough to its star for the outer ice crust of the planet to melt and the planet to end up being completely covered by an ocean of liquid water as much as 133 kilometers deep. The pressure on the floor of an ocean like that would be on the order of approximately 20,000 atm, 
which is sufficient for the formation of polymorphic modifications of ice, which are heavier than liquid water, and under this kind of pressure will never melt. Of course, for the emergence of biological life similar to that of the Earth, it is essential that the planet be in the habitable zone. This would permit the ice layer on the surface to melt. In addition to that, crucial minerals exist in the planetary crust. Between the layer of liquid water and the crust, this type of planet has a thick layer of solid ice, blocking access to the minerals. The latter, however, can be brought in by meteorites and comets. Who knows, maybe this planet is already teeming with marine life. Yes, of course, they will look different, since the red dwarf star has its own influence on its surrounding world. And by far, not every creature can adapt. But the truth is that we know very little about it at all. In any case, this world is extraordinarily enchanting. And what can be said about the two outermost planets, E and F? Although the data suggests, at very least, a water-rich atmosphere on their surfaces, nonetheless, these Venus-sized planets may be covered in ice and a thick atmosphere. This is also a good indicator. More time is needed to investigate these objects. But we also have good news. The largest infrared space telescope, the James Webb, is due to be launched as soon as in October 2021. And by the way, star L9859 will make its way into that zone of the sky, which Webb will be observing 200 days a year. And it is planned that in 2027, the ground-based optical telescope ELT will be commissioned, which will be two and a half times larger than the current record holder, the VLT. By means of these instruments, it will be possible to thoroughly research the planets of the L9859 system and examine these worlds closer. Of course, we're not destined to see exo-whales from such a distance. However, it is quite possible to determine whether the planets have an atmosphere and of which gases they consist. And this is an unbelievably immense amount of data about these distant and unknown worlds. The Milky Way is a relatively medium-sized galaxy which has nevertheless been able to provide a home to about one billion planets. Each of these worlds possesses its own unique features and characteristics that are sometimes radically different from those we are used to seeing on Earth. One of these unusual worlds could be a rocky planet that orbits four stars at once in the same system. Between one and a half and two astronomical units from the center of the system meet HD 98800. It is a multiple system of four stars located in the constellation crater approximately 150 light years from us. What can such a world signify? What kind of phenomena can occur on this planet? A bit later, we will definitely be imaginatively transported to this extraordinary world. Yes, in space there are more complex star systems with two, or even more rarely, three stars, which spin around each other in complex orbits. However, this new discovery is proof that this is not the limit. A group of astronomers were able to detect a system in the universe with four stars. Amazingly, all this time it was hiding a mere 146 light years from us. Instances of systems that consist of four stars are incredibly rare. However, the uniqueness of this object is further enhanced by the fact that HD 98800b has a protoplanetary disk. Using the Spitzer Space Telescope, Astronomers discovered that it is composed of two belts. The outer belt is separated from the center of a double star by 5.9 astronomical units, 
almost the same distance separating Jupiter from the Sun. Researchers suspect that this belt is made up of comets and asteroids. The inner belt is located at a distance of two astronomical units from the center as Mars is from the Sun and it looks like it is formed of fine dust. This kind of division of the protoplanetary disk into sections usually occurs during the formation of a planet but in this case it came about most likely for another reason. Under the influence of the gravity of neighboring mate HD 98800A. How is it possible? The fact is that in most systems it is aligned in respect to the main star. For example, in a solar system all the planets and most of the asteroids spin approximately on the same plane with the Sun. But this does not apply to HD 98800. It has a disk of gas and dust that is positioned at a right angle to the central stars. This is the first system that is known to us with a perpendicular disk and such an anomaly promises many more astonishing discoveries. Presumably, if astronomers manage to find other similar older systems, it will be possible to observe planets spinning in strange orbits at all sorts of angles. In turn, this might lead to the formation of new types of planets still unknown to science. However, another scenario is also possible. In such conditions, planets simply cannot form from a protoplanetary disk. The search remains to be continued. In space, there are still many curiosities unknown to mankind. On the other hand, we now understand that planetary formation can, at the very least, begin in these polar circumbinary disks. If the remaining portion of a planet's formation process can occur, there may be an entire population of displaced near-Earth planets that we have yet to discover with such things as odd seasonal variations. But although planetary formation may begin, it is unclear to what extent planets can form and remain stable in such a seemingly chaotic system. However, if planets were to exist, the view from one of them in a system like this would be amazing. A hypothetical observer would see a bright streak rising from the horizon across the entire sky. From time to time, stars will pass across it. And since the system consists of four celestial bodies, a total of four suns would be visible in the sky. Because of this, such a planet would have an intricate system of change of seasons which couldn't be compared with the Earth seasons of the year. An exoplanet that is about 1.35 times the size of Earth and eight times more massive is orbiting the brightest star in the system and in doing so receives five times more solar radiation from its star. The researchers calculate that the detected object will make a transit all the way across the front of its star, allowing observers from Earth to see the barely perceptible reduction of the light emitted by the star. The incredibly powerful effect of the four celestial bodies is literally tearing this planet apart. M104, the Sombrero Galaxy, NGC 4594, is perhaps one of the most familiar galaxies besides the Andromeda. You've most probably seen it in astronomy books. It got its name from its resemblance to the Mexican Sombrero hat. The galaxy is visible almost edge-on and there is a lane of dark dust running across the entire observable disk. M104 is located at a distance of 29.3 million light-years and in size is approximately 50,000 light-years across. Interestingly, the Sombrero is a double galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy located within an elliptical galaxy. Well, but what takes the cake is the galaxy's strong emission of radiation, which according to many astronomers is caused by a supermassive black hole in the core. But why did the Sombrero galaxy take on this shape? Was it always like this? Let's get to the bottom of it. This floating ring the size of a galaxy is the Sombrero itself, the largest object in the constellation of Virgo. 
It got its name because in the visible range it appears as a luminous cloud with an elliptical shape and an edge of dark matter. This image reveals the infrared glow recorded by the Spitzer Space Telescope. The image was digitally sharpened and overlaid with an optical image obtained from the Hubble telescope. Judging by the pictures, the Sombrero galaxy really doesn't look like others. This view of the galaxy really does resemble a hat, which is why it was called the Sombrero galaxy. Where is that Mexican who could give us the answer? It looks like he's hiding in the nebula. Well, let's try to figure it out. Now then, according to modern classification as we understand it, the formation of galaxies is considered to be a natural stage in the evolution of the universe that occurs under the influence of gravitational forces. Logic suggests that at the initial stage of the evolution of galaxies, particles of dust and gas began grouping together, fusing, colliding, and consequently clusters appeared, which subsequently developed into something massive. The variety of galaxy shapes is associated with a variety of initial conditions for the formation of the galaxies. The accumulation of hydrogen gas within the confines of these clusters became the first stars. But how come the sombrero doesn't look like any of the categories of galaxies? At least that's how it seems at first glance. The fact is, straight away this object consists of two different types of galaxies, most likely an elliptical and a spiral. And unlike in any other instances, their interlacing is incredibly well balanced and accordingly looks so beautiful. In addition, the sombrero is oriented edgewise to the observer on Earth, so astronomers find it difficult to categorically determine the shape of this cluster as a whole. Perhaps from the other side of the galaxy the sombrero looks completely different. But there is a second, no less curious hypothesis, which suggests that about 9 billion years ago, the accumulation of gas the cluster received from intergalactic space caused a head of galactic proportions to be formed. Be that as may, before us is a mystery and one of the most beautiful of the galaxies. What do we know about it? The Sombrero is located a distance of 28 million light-years from the Earth, in the constellation of Virgo, and is moving away from us at a speed of 1,000 kilometers per second. Despite being such a large distance away, astronomers first discovered this object back in the 18th century. Its bright radiance, which emanates out from the galaxy for millions of light-years all around, helped them to detect it. The Sombrero galaxy, or M104, has a colossal mass. Indeed, according to some estimates, the total weight of this space object is equal to the mass of 800 billion of our suns. Such a massive weight is due to the presence of the countless stars in the galaxy, as well as the vast ring of dust that encircles it around the perimeter. The structure of the Sombrero galaxy, even today, doesn't cease to amaze both amateurs and professionals of astronomy. What's happening in the center of this spiral galaxy? In the image, the distinct dark lanes of dust are visible, as well as the bright halo of the stars and globular clusters. The blue emission of the galaxy is caused by the glow of the massive hot young stars that populate it. The abundance of gas and dust clouds and the presence of bright blue giants speaks of the active star formation processes that is taking place in the Sombrero galaxy. Looking closely at the central component in this photo, you can see many pinpoint sources of light, which are the globular clusters. The spectacular dust rings of M104 hide a large number of the young and bright stars and have a very complex structure that is still not fully understood by astronomers. The very central portion of the Sombrero galaxy radiates in all ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum. There is evidence indicating that at the center of the Sombrero galaxy is a supermassive black hole with a mass equal to one billion suns. This information has been confirmed by data from the Hubble Space Telescope, which has recorded the extremely fast rotation of the stars in the center of Sombrero. Also, the central portion of the galaxy is emitting an abnormally large quantity of X-rays, which may also indicate the presence of a black hole at its core. If desired, it can even be seen with an amateur telescope. 
it's sufficient to point it at the southern edge of the Virgo cluster and the galaxy will appear right before your eyes. Its apparent magnitude is 8, so it won't be difficult for you to locate it, but you won't be able to see all the beauty in great detail. We can only imagine how many amazing worlds of the many distant galaxies and systems could possibly be out there. Our universe is immense, and in it there are a considerable number of massive objects. There are giant planets, stars, in comparison with which our sun is just a grain of sand. Galaxies, clusters and superclusters of galaxies, walls and voids. This succession can continue, increasing in size and mass. And at any given point of this progression, you can find its accepted record holder up to this point anyway. In this video, we will introduce you to the largest galaxies in the observable universe. So, fifth place in our galactic parade is taken by 3C348 of Hercules A, a yellowish galaxy with a diameter of 1.5 million light years at a distance of about 2 billion light years. Hercules A is one of the brightest extragalactic radio sources. The galaxy is about 1000 times more massive than the Milky Way and Hercules A contains a black hole that is also 1000 times more massive than the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Unless you are a professional astronomer, you are unlikely to notice anything unusual in the photographs of the galaxies of Hercules A taken with the optical imaging. Even in the best of the shots, you will see an outwardly ordinary elliptical star system, of which thousands can be found in the vastness of space. But take your time. Observations have shown that Hercules A is very far from the Earth. In addition to that, with the development of radio astronomy, further observations have shown that by radio waves, the galaxy looks completely different than it does in optical images. The radio waves do not emanate from the galaxy itself, but from two powerful jets shooting out from its center. In optical imaging, they are completely invisible, but then by radio waves, they show a complex structure. The next galaxy is IC1101, which for a long time was considered the largest in the observable universe, is rightfully in fourth place and resides in the massive cluster of galaxies Abel 2029 that is located on the very edge of the constellation of Virgo at a distance of 1.04 billion light years from the Earth. The galaxy has a diameter of approximately 6 million light years. If we compare it with the Milky Way, then it is 60 times larger and 2,000 times heavier. Had IC1101 been in the location of the Milky Way, it would have swallowed up the large and the small Magellanic clouds, the Andromeda Nebula and the Triangulum Galaxy. Before you is UGC 9555, a huge galaxy that occupies third place. This galaxy is located directly in the galaxy triplet system named UGC 9555. The cluster is located in the direction of the constellation Camelopardalis, a distance of 820 million light years from the Earth. This enormous star studded island is just over 8 million light years in diameter. At the moment, the mass of this radio galaxy is quite difficult to estimate, but experts believe that it is no less than 65 to 75 trillion times the mass of the Sun. Like most huge galaxies, UGC 9555 attained such a size and acquired such a considerable mass due to the fact that it relentlessly consumed neighboring galaxies that dwelled close to the inhabitants of the cluster. Behold, almost the leader, but still in second place in our intergalactic battle today, 3C236 and it's 15 million light years away. It is a radio galaxy of the Fanarov and Riley second class. It ranks among the largest of the known radio galaxies and is located in the direction of the constellation Leo Minor. The galaxy features a double-double radio morphology, consisting of a giant relic source and an inner, more compact radio source. 
A recent episode of star formation closer to the core can be associated with the event that led to the reignition of radioactivity. And here finally, we have reached the leader for the moment, the galaxy Alcyoneus. In a new study, it became clear that its length is already equal to more than 16 million light years and it is located a distance of 3 billion light years from the Earth. Researchers encountered the cosmic supergiant with the help of the so-called radio lobes, which are inherent to all massive galaxies, with the inclusion of our Milky Way. The existence of similar lobes on the Alcyoneus galaxy was able to be detected using the low-frequency array inferometric network consisting of 20,000 radio antennas mounted on 52 platforms in various European countries. The discovered galaxy turned out to be a genuine supergiant, the likes of which has never been detected in the entire history of space observation. There is a supermassive black hole in the center of Alcyoneus, which slows down the formation of new stars and thus greatly affects the life cycle of the galaxy as a whole. Sometimes this causes a violent spectacle. The black hole, absorbing material from the giant disk around it, can form two jets that eject fuel for new stars from the galaxy at a speed of close to the speed of light. These plumes or jets travel huge distances and then turn into giant radio-emitting lobes. During this process, the stellar dust is heated to such a degree that it dissolves into plasma and begins to radiate in the radio frequency range. The galaxy is also impresses with its other characteristics, which researchers have been able to measure thanks to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. For example, the supermassive black hole at the center of Alcyoneus is 400 million times more massive than our Sun and the mass of the entire galaxy is estimated to be 240 billion times the mass of our Sun. As you can see, the majority of radio galaxies have gigantic dimensions, but why all of them aren't huge remains a mystery. It's believed that these giants are the oldest radio galaxies that have existed long enough, perhaps several hundred million years, for their radio jets to grow to an enormous size. If this is true, then there must be many more giant radio galaxies that are known today. And the discovery of similar giants and their study helps determine the evolution of galaxies in the first place. After all, we are talking about a powerful galactic structure that originated from what was at a one time a completely commonplace galaxy. The Andromeda Nebula has been known to man since ancient times. The first to notice it were the Chaldean priests, astronomers of the ancient world. At some point in the past, the Andromeda Galaxy was the spitting image of our home, the Milky Way. But with the development of astronomy, this myth was dispelled. It turned out that the Milky Way and Andromeda belong to different subclasses of spiral galaxies and the configuration of their arms is quite different. But nonetheless, they still have a lot in common. For example, an appetite for devouring their dwarf satellite galaxies. Their internal structure is also similar. The Andromeda Galaxy, also known as M31, looks like a spiral the lines of the arms of which being evenly dispersed around the spherical bulge, the central, bright part of the galaxy, which consists mainly of old, bright stars moving in extensive, elongated orbits. The Milky Way today, on the other hand, is assumed to be a galaxy of the SBBC classification, a barred, spiral galaxy. The difference between our galaxy and M31 lies precisely in the bar. This is the portion that extends from the edges of the bulge and connects it to the arms. The nucleus of the Andromeda galaxy, like the nuclei of many other galaxies in the universe, has candidates located in them that have the potential to become supermassive black holes. 
based on the results of calculations, the size of such an object could exceed that of up to 140 million times the mass of our Sun. In addition, the Hubble telescope discovered a mysterious disk which contained young blue stars surrounding supermassive black holes. They revolve around a relativistic object in exactly the same way planetary bodies do around their stars. Astronomers are a bit puzzled by how this kind of a disk could form so close to such a huge object. According to calculations, the enormous tidal forces of supermassive black holes should limit the gas and dust clouds from coalescing and forming new stars. Well, further observations will likely provide us with clues to this mystery. According to rough estimates, the Milky Way may contain between 100 and 400 billion stars. But this is nothing compared to Andromeda, which may contain about a trillion. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, among this trillion, scientists have learned about the presence of a very large and sparse population of hot and bright stars. Hot young stars tend to appear blue. However, the blue stars found in the Andromeda galaxy appear to be growing old, more like the Sun. Stars that have burned out their inner layers and are revealing their hot blue cores. They are scattered all across the center of the galaxy and are the brightest in the ultraviolet range. Besides that, there are other interesting objects located in the core of M31. Along these lines, a double or a binary cluster of stars was discovered in the center of Andromeda galaxy. This discovery turned out to be highly prized by the astronomical community since the merging of the two clusters into one could happen over a fairly short period of time, roughly in about a hundred thousand years. Based on calculations, astronomers have determined that the merging should have happened millions of years ago. However, Due to some strange and still inexplicable reasons, it did not happen. According to one hypothesis, there may not be a double cluster at all in the middle of M31, but rather something like a ring consisting of old red stars. The ring might look like two clusters, because when observing, we only see the stars from the opposite side. The ring of the disk is turned to our galaxy on one side, from which it can be concluded that there is a certain interrelation between them. When studying the center of the Andromeda galaxy using the XMM Newton telescope, a group of astronomers also discovered 63 discrete sources with X-ray emissions. Most of them, that being 46 objects, have been identified as binary X-ray stars, whereas other objects are acting as neutron stars or candidates for black holes from binary systems. About 460 globular clusters have also been registered in the galaxy. The most massive of them, Mayal 2 or G1, has a luminosity greater than that of any cluster in the local group. It is even brighter than the brightest cluster in the Milky Way, Omega Centauri. It is located at a distance of about 130,000 light years from the center of M31 galaxy and mainly consists of about 300,000 old stars. Similarly, the PA99N2 star is located in Andromeda, around which orbits the exoplanet, which is the first to be discovered outside the Milky Way. But as it stands today, the planet is still considered to be unconfirmed. However, in view of the scale of the Andromeda system, the presence of so many stars in it and an even larger number of planets, it is quite possible, at least according to the logic of the theory of probability, that among this abundance of planets, there are planets that are quite suitable for life, or already have life on them. After hundreds of thousands of years, we will be able to see everything much better, given the fact 
that a collision of the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way is inevitable. Mind you, this will happen in about 4 billion years. We'll be substantially older. Amazing outer space and the remarkable beauty of the galaxies to which there is no end or brink. We invite you to become acquainted with the closest of them and to explore their unique features which are capable of capturing our imagination and are of particular interest to astronomy. Now then, the local group of galaxies, like its other neighboring groups of galaxies and more densely populated clusters of galaxies, is part of a mass concentration, the local supercluster of galaxies. This system has a diameter of about 100 million light years and a thickness of about 35. Its center is a massive cluster of galaxies in Virgo separated from us by a distance of 50 million light years. And the first to take this galactic baton is the third largest galaxy in size and mass in the local group, as well as being the closest unbarred spiral galaxy to the Milky Way. This refers to M33 or the Triangulum Galaxy in the constellation of the same name. It possesses the enormous black hole X7 which has a mass equal to about 16 times that of the Sun. It is one of the largest known stellar mass black holes. In addition to the Milky Way and its satellites, the Andromeda Galaxy, the closest giant spiral type barred galaxy to us, also with its satellites, which dominates the local group, also belongs to a friendly company of galaxies which stretch out for about 3 million light years in width. It is separated from us by a distance of two and a half billion light years. It rightfully occupies a dominant position, since it is one and a half times more massive than our galaxy. But we will not dwell on it in greater detail, since the channel already has a separate video completely dedicated to this world. We continue our journey, and before us stretches galaxy NGC 5128 or Centaurus A, the closest lenticular galaxy with a polar ring to the Milky Way in the constellation of Centaurus. This is one of the brightest and closest to us of the neighboring galaxies. In terms of brightness, this galaxy ranks fifth after the Magellanic Clouds, the Andromeda Nebula and the Triangulum Galaxy. Before us is the irregular Wolf Landmark Mallet Galaxy discovered in 1909 by Max Wolf. It is located in the constellation of Cetus at the edge of the local group. It's at a distance from us of about 3 million light years, experiencing tidal interaction from another member of the local group, the dwarf elliptical galaxy PGC 29194. Further is NGC 300, a spiral galaxy from a group of galaxies in the Sculpture constellation. This is the closest cluster of galaxies to us. It is located about 6.1 million light years from the Milky Way. Astronomers have ascertained that NGC 300 is larger than had been previously thought. It turns out that the galaxy belongs to a large rarefied outer disk of old stars, more than twice the size of any known before. Thus, the size of NGC 300 turned out to be 47,000 light years. We continue our journey and we see in front of us galaxy NGC 55, a galaxy in the southern hemisphere of the sky located on the border of the Sculptor and Phoenix constellations, seen almost edge-on. NGC 55 is an SBM, Bored Magellanic Spiral type dwarf galaxy, and is relatively close, at a distance of 6.5 million light-years. In the visible range, four concentrations with increased brightness can be noted. 
which are the largest globular clusters. The galactic nucleus is the most powerful radio source in the constellation. It belongs to the sculptor group of galaxies, where it is one of the largest. But in order to reach the galaxy Maffei too, you'd have to grow older over and over and over again, since the galaxy is located at a distance of 12 million light years. Maffei too is a spiral galaxy located in the constellation of Cassiopeia. Most of the galaxy's infrared radiation comes from cosmic dust. This dust is found primarily within the spiral arms and has been shown to be associated with star formation. Four zero four. No, this isn't a fault in the matrix. It's the name of the next galaxy in front of you the NGC 404 galaxy in the constellation of Andromeda. Due to its proximity to the bright star Mirage, which obstructs observation of NGC 404, the galaxy is called the Ghost of Mirage. The galaxy and the star are approximately seven minutes of arc apart. Thanks to this sort of neighborhood, the Ghost of Mirage is easy to find even with a small telescope. You just have to locate Mirage, and the galaxy will also be in the field of view. Further is NGC 2403, a galaxy in the constellation of the Giraffe, part of the M81 group of galaxies. Most of the stars that populate this galaxy are old, metal-poor stars, about 12 billion years old, which arose in the early burst of star formation. But there are small groups of young, hot, blue stars Galaxy NGC 2403 is part of the M81 group of galaxies. Visibly, the galaxy also contains blue open clusters, dark dust streaks and a relatively small core glowing in the center. In addition to NGC 2403, the group also includes another 40 dwarf galaxies. We are arriving at the next incredible object, the Cigar Spiral Galaxy, or M82, in the constellation of Ursa Major. This is an object with fairly powerful star formation and a supermassive black hole in the center with a mass of as much as 30 million solar masses. Yet another amazing galaxy, PGC 45279, is a barred spiral galaxy, SBC, in the constellation of Centaurus. It looks quite similar to our galaxy, but X-ray observations show the presence of a Seyfert quasar-like nuclei, probably containing an active supermassive black hole, and it's at a distance to us of 11.7 million light-years. And finally, the most distant object that we will get a view of today is the Caldwell Galaxy, Caldwell 5 or IC342. An intermediate type spiral galaxy in the constellation of Giraffe. It is located near the galactic plane, where the absorption of radiation by dust hampers observation of the galaxy. For the same reason, it is difficult to determine the exact distance to the galaxy. Current estimates place it at a distance of 17 million light-years. That wraps it up. Our short journey observing the most interesting galaxies in the local group has come to an end. The study of these objects is very useful and instructive for explaining the formation and history of the life of the most commonplace, the most abundant star systems in the universe. You've probably heard statements like these. The pilot is experiencing a force of seven Gs or gravitational forces. Or 
the acceleration force was 9 Gs, or perhaps even more. Indeed, you yourself regularly experience stressful forces in everyday life. Well, that is not only emotional, but also physical. How do G-forces affect a person on Earth? How are they felt in space, and even at faster than light speeds? Let's try to answer these questions. To begin with, as always, you should understand what G-forces are and how they occur. From the definition, it follows that a G-force is the ratio of the absolute value of linear acceleration caused by non-gravitational forces to the standard acceleration of free fall at the surface of the Earth. Being the ratio of two accelerations, G-force is a dimensionless value, but is often stated in units of the standard acceleration of free fall, G, or gravity, which is 9.8 tenth of a meter per second squared. This represents how many times greater the force of inertia is in relation to the usual force of gravity acting upon a body under conditions of the Earth at sea level. And the more abrupt the maneuver, the stronger the g-force. The fact is, the human body is able to tolerate accelerations of higher than 9 g's for brief durations, but very few are capable of enduring them for more protracted periods of time. If it's only for brief moments, we humans can handle much higher g-forces without suffering serious injury. The record for enduring momentarily high g-forces belongs to Eli Beating, who rolled backwards on a special rocket-powered sled in 1958 and literally took a force of 82.6 g's in the chest when the sled accelerated to 55 km per hour in one-tenth of a second. Beating lost consciousness, but got away with only small bruises on his back, demonstrating the incredible capabilities of the body. John Ivanovich Gridunov, an equipment tester for the Soviet space program, was also involved in numerous experiments that verified the limits of the human body. They even called him the ground-based astronaut. While testing a pressure suit, he underwent a number of experiments in a high-altitude pressure chamber, including uncontrolled decompression. During a simulated emergency landing, he experienced an impact force of 50 Gs as well as having withstood a force of 19 Gs in the region of thoracic spine on a centrifuge. Even the Orion spacecraft won't be able to deliver our full velocity potential. But let's glance into the distant future, when spaceships will be able to travel extremely fast, thousands of times faster than with today's technology. Let's remember that light travels at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. Consequently, if we assume that we will be able to overcome known technological limitations and build hyperspeed spacecraft, our delicate bodies, made mostly of water, will have to contend with the new risks that will result from such high-speed travel. If humans do acquire the ability to travel faster than light, the potential dangers that may be encountered are the discovery of a mind-boggling paradigm or the detection of wormholes in the current physical state. Even if we begin speeding up to 40,000 km per hour, the acceleration should be gradual. After all, it is specifically acceleration that affects the magnitude of the g-force. Hypothetically, you can speed a ship with a person aboard up to the speed of light. Let's just try to ignore the laws of physics here and make believe. But the question is not with the terminal velocity or final speed, but in how quickly it gathers that speed. If in a year our passenger remains safe at a speed of 1 km per second, even with a moderate increase in acceleration, that person won't have enough of his average life expectancy left to do it. If by chance he did achieve such a speed, contrary to all the laws of physics, he should feel no worse than he would being in an airplane. Having said that, if the acceleration from zero to speed of light took just a second, well, that'd be better not to imagine. Rapid acceleration and deceleration can be fatal for a human. Bodily injuries during road accidents occur during the process of the sudden drop in speed from tens of kilometers per hour to zero in a fraction of a second. 
It's all about the property of the universe known as inertia, as a result of which an object with mass resists change to its state of motion. Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion at the same speed and in the same direction until external forces have an effect upon it. Taking all these factors into account, according to researchers' most conservative and modest estimates, the group of colonizers should initially consist of 98 people. Besides, each of the 49 married couples should, to begin with, be selected by DNA analysis in order to ensure maximum genetic diversity. If a smaller crew were to set out on the voyage, the success of the mission would already be in question. For example, the chances of survival for 25 married couples is already estimated at about 50%. And if there are only 32 or even fewer settlers, the odds leave them no chance at all, 0%. Perhaps the descendants of the original crew will reach Proxima Centauri, but by that time, they will no longer be able to establish a sustainable colony. But this poses the question, but what if we use cryonics or suspended animation? This is a type of hibernation that can be beneficial in helping the travelers to conserve emotional resources and avoid burnout. It is possible, but not for long. In fact, for much shorter than we think, since this sort of hibernation carries risks, even if people go into it for several months and not years. The consequences may not be reversible, and from what was a strong team, all that will remain will be exhausted and depressed travelers. Therefore, we're back to the old scenario. So having left the Earth behind, the 98 space travelers will give birth to children and they to grandchildren, even during the lifetime of the first generation. So judging by the calculations, the maximum population on the Ark could reach 500 people. And this means that the colonists will have to provide themselves with food on their own. In other words, grow it directly on board the ship. But how much food do they need? After all, the size of the ship depends on this and therefore the energy required to move it. These calculations require taking not only the size of the crew into account, but also the average age of the spaceship's inhabitants, their height, weight, and level of physical activity, in order to understand how many calories they will each need annually. If the ship is constructed in the form of a rotating cylinder, so that the centrifugal force provides artificial gravity, then the height of the agricultural compartment should be 320 meters with a radius of 224 meters. During transit, some of the star's light passes through the exoplanet's atmospheres, transformed by the atmosphere's chemical composition. This has given astronomers the opportunity to remotely study the climate of terrestrial worlds outside the solar system. And this is important because TRAPPIST one worlds are the most optimal worlds available to us today. They provide the first opportunities for humanity to detect signs of biology beyond the solar system. During transit, some of the star's light passes through the exoplanet's atmospheres, transformed by the atmosphere's chemical composition. This has given astronomers the opportunity to remotely study the climate of terrestrial worlds outside the solar system. And this is important because Trappist, one worlds are the most optimal worlds available to us today. They provide the first opportunities for humanity to detect signs of biology beyond the solar system. Their initial discovery was made with a small telescope. A little later, exoplanets were discovered with the Trappist Spitzer and full telescopes. All seven planets are in or near the habitable zone of their star. 
and could have liquid water in one form or another. For astronomers, this is perhaps the best known laboratory for studying planets outside the solar system for their suitability for life. Finally, the James Webb Telescope has set its eyes on these distant worlds. At the outset, it is worth noting that the telescope has confirmed that of the seven known exoplanets in the Trappist, one system, three are in the habitable zone. Planets D, E, and F are the third, fourth, and fifth exoplanets. According to the measured density, Trappist, Oneb, the first from the star, may either have a small nucleus or, more likely, contain a significant fraction of water or other volatiles in its composition. In view of the too high surface temperatures of the first two exoplanets, the maintenance of water in liquid form there is highly unlikely. The fifth exoplanet, F, has a fairly low density and maybe an ocean planet with space tangents in its interior. By the way, to date, it is believed that the habitable zone may be wider if we consider volcanic hydrogen as a potential greenhouse gas, contributing to the increase in climatic temperature. The telescope also saw some similarities with Centauri Proxima, namely that the X-ray emission of Trappist. One system approximately corresponds to the X-ray emission of Proxima Centauri, and the ultraviolet radiation produced by hydrogen atoms from the chromospheric layer of the star is already six times less than on Centauri. For this reason, the two closest exoplanets to the star, Trappist, Oneb and Trappist, Wonek, could have lost their atmospheres and hydrospheres and hydrospheres in a time span of two to three billion years if their initial masses were similar to Earth's. However, replenishment of atmospheric hydrogen and oxygen may occur through a reaction in which molecules of chemical compounds are broken down by photons if the planets contain a lot of water in one form or another in their composition. Currently, the James Webb Telescope has studied the exoplanet Trappist, Oneb, in more detail, where signs of a high-density atmosphere of the closest planet to the star are not detected or optically thin. Further observations showed that this exoplanet receives four times more radiation than Earth from the Sun and is in tidal capture. The temperature of the day side of the planet was estimated with a maximum of 260 degrees Celsius, according to telescope data. And most likely, the heat is not being distributed from the day side to the night side to the night side. Also in the new study, there's already data from a second rocky exoplanet, Trappist, Wonek, which is also in a tidal lock. The planet is interesting because it could be, in fact, a twin of Venus since it's about the same size and receives the same amount of radiation from its star, but still not as harsh, because it has a daytime temperature of about 106 degrees Celsius versus Venus's 420 degrees. And yet, it still gives you an aggressive tan. Although these first measurements do not provide definitive information about the nature of Trappist, Wunek, they help narrow down the range of possibilities. The results are consistent with the exoplanet being essentially a rock consisting of caves and rocks with no atmosphere and no living aliens, but still not as harsh because it has a daytime temperature of about 106 degrees Celsius versus Venus's 420 degrees. And yet, it still gives you an aggressive tan. Although these first measurements do not provide definitive information about the nature of Trappist, Wunek they help narrow down the range of possibilities. The results are consistent with the exoplanet being essentially a rock consisting of caves and rocks with no atmosphere and no living aliens. The James Webb Telescope is currently studying galactic nebulae and black holes, but it also has another important goal. The star system LP791-18 is 89 light years away in the constellation Cratera and has at least two planets. The system was originally found by ground and space telescopes, TESS and Spitzer, by observing the orbit of the Earth-sized planet 
it was found that the surface has volcanic activity, which could lead to the existence of an atmosphere, thanks to which water can condense. Moreover, the planet is on the inner edge of the habitable zone, which is neither too hot nor too cold for water in liquid form to exist, not only in the atmosphere, but also on the surface. In the same star system, there is another planet, ALP 791, 18, a more massive and larger gas giant, which in turn exerts a significant gravitational force on the Earth, like planet. The gravitational force also slightly deforms both the planet itself and its inhabitants, because of which it is observed high volcanic activity. Similar processes occur on one of the moons of Jupiter. Researchers have already received approval to study the atmosphere of LP-791, 18 with the James Webb Telescope, thanks to which it will be possible to learn more about the planet. The James Webb Space Telescope is now practically the world's premier space observatory, allowing us to peer into distant worlds around other stars, explore mysterious structures, and learn more about the origins of the universe and our place in it. So far, nearly 6,000 exoplanets in 4,000 star systems have already been confirmed, with several thousand more candidates awaiting verification. Of course, the public's attention is focused on planets that are as Earth-like as possible. We have not given up hope of finding intelligent life in space. However, the bulk of distant worlds look very strange to us. There are often conditions there that we can't even imagine. After all, science fiction writers have long advised people not to fixate on our carbon-based form of life. There may be much in the universe beyond our understanding, but science exists to push those boundaries. Have you ever wondered what the universe sounds like? But can you hear sound in space? Yes, you can. Sound is a vibration that propagates in a medium as a wave, which is why it cannot propagate in a perfect vacuum. Space is certainly a vacuum, but not a perfect vacuum. On the scale of the solar system, an interstellar cloud, or the galaxy, waves of various natures propagate, the sources of which can be the solar wind, gas turbulence, gas, dust cloud collisions, or supernovae outbursts. When it comes to the cosmos, it is important to realize that the universe is filled with different sound waves that we cannot see or hear, but powerful telescopes, including orbiting telescopes, can. By converting this data into sound through a process called sounding, we can gain new insights into the universe. In this video, you'll hear the sound of the early universe, just moments after the Big Bang, a supermassive black hole, a strong wind from a star, and the most common type of exoplanets currently found throughout the galaxy. Finally, we'll listen to the space between stars, the lonely interstellar medium, and much more. Enjoy the show.